In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. At the sound they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded, and in amazement they asked, Are not all these people who are speaking Galileans? Then how does each of us hear them in our own native language? We are Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya near Cyrene, as well as travelers from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, yet we hear them speaking in our own tongues the mighty acts of God. We complete our reflection on the meaning of the cross and the revelation of who God is and who we are in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Once upon a time, not really all that long ago, but far enough away to have nothing in common with anyone here. There was a man named Herschel. Now Herschel was a scrawny little kid, skinny little arms and toothpicks for legs. Kids in school would tease him and call him wimpy, stick man, and the pencil-necked geek. When it was time to play games on the playground, Herschel was always the last one chosen and his team always complained that they had to have him, have him on their side. These names hurt Herschel's feelings, and as soon as summer vacation started, Herschel decided it was time to change. So one day, Herschel stood in front of a big mirror to see where to begin. Ah, the toothpick legs. Herschel began jogging until he could outrun anyone in the neighborhood. Now with strong legs, he went back to the mirror. Ah, the skinny little arms. He began lifting weights, and after a while, his arms, chest, and neck began to bulge with muscles. He had pipes, pecs, and a neck the size of a football defensive tackle. Why, he could crush a Diet Coke against his forehead, unopened. <laughs> he was ready for school to start. The first day of school came and Herschel strode confidently into class. All the kids oohed and awed. They nicknamed him Arnold and Claude and The Rock and Iron Man, and the teachers dated themselves and called him Rocky Balboa. <laughs> when it was time to play games on the playground, Herschel was the first one chosen, and the other team complained that they didn't have Herschel on their side. But then a strange thing happened. Before the game was over, Herschel uh, poof, collapsed, no matter how hard he tried to stand up. Uh, boom. His friends tried to help him, but uh, boom. You see, it was all because of the mirror Herschel used. It didn't go all the way to the floor. Herschel did not see that his ankles were the same scrawny toothpicks as his legs once were. And even though Herschel was the picture of strength, his ankles were too weak to hold up any more of Herschel's new changes. So, too, our look in the mirror of God's image is incomplete without the Holy Spirit. As you may have heard me say last Sunday, if our faith party is just me and Jesus, then the Holy Spirit wasn't invited. As God the Father, our creator, has given life and goodness to all creation, 
so too is God fully revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This oneness in perfect love between the Father and the Son pours out on us the presence of God in the Holy Spirit, the reflection of perfect love, the revelation of our completion in the image and likeness of God. Our true identity, therefore, rooted in the sign of the cross, is rooted in the Trinity and finds its completion in the unity of the mystical body of Christ, in the relationships we have as sisters and brothers, in communion with the church universal, from whom we are given a share in the mission of Jesus Christ through apostolic works. The one word in the sacred scriptures that runs like a thread from Genesis to Pentecost is breath. God breathed over the waters of creation God breathed and our souls were created. And this same breath, this same spirit is breathed upon the apostles by the risen Christ. The new Genesis, the new creation, the church of Pentecost. God breathes us into life and when we die, God inhales our last breath into eternity. In this life, we are sent forth as an Easter people in a Good Friday world to continue the mission of Jesus Christ to make him known and loved. It is only in the Holy Spirit that all is complete, all is being perfected in holiness, all is one as the mystical body of Christ on earth, the church, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. In fact, as St. Paul reminds us in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, we cannot confess Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. In an older image of the church, the high holy feast days of Christmas and Easter are but two of the three legs on a three-legged stool. The third leg is Pentecost. It can give us reflective pause when there is such to do in our parishes over Christmas and Easter while Pentecost Sunday seems to be the last gasp in a long Easter season. Christmas and Easter have packed pews and big choirs, while Pentecost is typically a regular Sunday with tired choirs wearing red shirts. But hey, shh, don't tell anybody out there about Pentecost. They'll just ruin it like what happened to Christmas and Easter and all the popular feasts of the church. Happy holidays, ho, 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 and mistletoe. White bunnies pooping out dyed eggs in a nest of plastic grass. Zombies looking for candy on All Hallowed Eve. No, shh, don't tell anybody about Pentecost. They'll just ruin it. Let's not make too big of a deal about the Feast of Pentecost lest it go the way of Groundhog's Day on February 2nd. Instead of the feast of the presentation of the Lord, we have some little rodent out east, determining by its shadow or lack thereof the length of winter in Minnesota as if. <laughs> no, don't tell anyone about Pentecost. They'll just ruin it, like they did with the feast of St. Patrick on March 17th. Parades with so much green beer that people missed the feast of St. Joseph on March 19th. <laughs> oh, I can see it now if you go tell people. The evangelicals will set their hair on fire and release doves up into the sky. We'll have to go to the stores and do Pentecost shopping. Seven gifts for each family member. White chocolate doves and red velvet cake. And of course, in the evening of this great feast, we'll all have to sit outside around bonfires, eating s'mores, scaring each other with stories of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> no, please don't tell anyone about Pentecost. They'll just ruin it. Everyone will go around for one day babbling incoherently and claiming they understand rap music. <laughs> Let Christmas and Easter wobble without the third leg. 
At least they won't ruin our great feast of Pentecost. Except we can't. We can't keep Pentecost a secret. We can't be quiet about the movement of the Holy Spirit because without Pentecost, we can't be church. And we ourselves are incomplete without the Holy Spirit. Our mirrors won't go to the floor. Herein is our entry into the mystery of the sign of the cross, the Holy Spirit, who makes it all understandable, even though it is the greatest mystery in our lives. Christmas is the birth of Easter, and Pentecost is the birth of the church. Yet for all of us reborn in baptism, the Feast of Pentecost is a continuation of the workings of the Holy Spirit moving through us as powerfully as it did upon the apostles at that first Pentecost. Up until this very day and continuing to the end of time, we most beautifully see the workings of the Holy Spirit forming us as a community of faith. Perhaps more than ever before in my 30 plus years as a priest, we live in a time of great division. We are polarized, politicized, materialized, and individualized. Our sense of community has shifted from a generation or two ago. A generation or two ago, parishes served the existing community. Now parishes are the community because in so many areas, real community no longer exists. It is easy for us to treat the church as a dispenser of what I spiritually need, but it is quite another thing for each of us to actually build a community out of so many different individuals and families. Individually, none of us can be our own church any more than any one of us can be our own community. Again, when our faith party is just me and Jesus, the Holy Spirit wasn't invited. It's like when Muhammad Ali, after he'd won the title of boxing's heavyweight champion of the world, began to brag with reporters about being the best, the greatest, and no one would ever defeat him. Boasting his way onto a plane, he sat down and began giving out autographs. A flight attendant came by and said, Mr. Ali, you need to buckle your seatbelt. He responded, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. To which the flight attendant replied, Superman doesn't need an airplane to fly. <laughs> we need church and we need to be we. The present presence of the Holy Spirit not only pours upon each of us an abundance of gifts more than we will ever discover in an entire lifetime, but also inspires our hearts to bring these gifts together, for we find our wholeness and our holiness and our identity in communion, in community with each other. For the gifts of the Holy Spirit do not just come to us, they come through us, for and with one another. For the gifts of the Spirit is a marvelous witness to the mission of Jesus Christ that comes to us to carry out as church. And it is the action of the Holy Spirit that we have formed communities of faith among so many languages cultures, opinions, and ways of living, a marvelous unity of a very diverse and different people. Let us not underestimate how amazing it is indeed that we've all managed to gather in this one place on this day. Here we pray, here we sing in one voice, for indeed, as the old Latin proverb says, prayer travels faster when said in unison. What message do we all hear in our own way of speaking? Is it not the language of love? For it is the spirit of love that unites us as one body, the body of Christ. No matter who we are, where we have been, where we are going, or what languages we speak. 
What divides us is not our differences. We can and we have brought together into one community a whole world of differences. We are divided any time there is a rejection of those who are different. The gifts of the Holy Spirit unite us as church. Unity, mission, peace, and forgiveness are all part of the language of love in every language. For God's love is a bridge that connects very different and sometimes opposite shores. As the Holy Spirit forms us as the church, we continue the work of the Holy Spirit by building these bridges between one another in the example of how God loves us in Jesus. So we are not to build feeble foot bridges that wash out in the first flood of misunderstanding. The love of God is forgiving and reconciling, rebuilding us when we sin, not tearing us down for our mistakes, and so must our love for one another be the same. We are not to build drawbridges where we interrupt our relationships with another, one another as a parish in order to give priority to floating momentary whims. The love of God is constant, steadfast, and committed, and so must our love for one another be the same. We are not to build toll bridges where we charge one another with our expectations. Do this, don't be like that, and then I will love you. No, the love of God is freely given to all people. It is a gift. None of us has to earn it or even deserve it. The love of God is abundantly poured out on us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit with no strings attached. God's love is revealed in Jesus Christ and shared with us by the Holy Spirit is unconditional accepting us for who we are and as we are. And so must our love for one another be the same. We are not to build troll bridges where we form relationships and then become the grumpy old ogre who feels the need to dominate, own, and control every relationship. Who's trumping on my bridge, says the ogre. The love of God is compassionate and inviting, universally offered to all people, the more, the merrier. All are welcome. It is not a love that judges whether or not we are worthy. It is a love that makes us worthy. It is a love that withers when hoarded, yet flourishes when shared. And so must our love for one another be the same. The love of God revealed to us in Jesus Christ and given to us in the gifts of the Holy Spirit is a permanent and faithful bridge, compassionate and inviting, unconditional, supportive, sharing, honest and open, ever ready to forgive and every, ever ready to build up anyone who is knocked down for any reason. It is the language of God's love that unites us as one people. This unity is made possible because we receive this great sacrament of love, the person and real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. It is in the spirit when we receive the body of Christ that we become the body of Christ and we transcend all that is wrong in our human nature to glimpse right here the perfection of our spiritual identity, the truth of who we are. We glimpse here the heaven that is already here that strengthens us on our pilgrimage to the heaven that is yet to come. In the Catholic Church, we leave no one behind. As we go forth from here into the world to carry out the mission of Jesus Christ, we recognize that our mission is to speak this universal language of love. The Holy Spirit moves us to be messengers of unity instead of division. Truly, we know the world does not need any more messengers of bad news. We are called to be heralds of the good news, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and make people wonder what we're up to when they see our joy. The life of faith is not just about me. It's all about we. Just as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons, yet one God, so too we are to be a multitude of persons 
yet one people. It is in the spirit that we are transformed by grace into this mystical body of Christ, the church, that is always greater than those who lead it and always bigger than all those who belong to it. Let me say this again. The church to which we belong is always bigger than those who lead it and always greater than all those who belong to it. Without this Holy Spirit, we are all too human, all too fatally flawed, all too imperfect. It is the same spirit we say amen to when we receive the body of Christ from this altar. It is in the spirit that two become one in holy matrimony. It is in the spirit that those who are called are anointed and ordained to service through holy orders. It is in the spirit we are absolved of our sins and gifted with the virtue of the sacred chrism at our confirmation. It is in the spirit that we are made a new creation and baptized by the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Most often when we think of the darkness that is in our world, we think of suffering, disease, famine, war, and death. But a large part of the darkness in our world is blindness, the sin of blindness, when we cannot see the goodness and giftedness of each and every person. We are often blinded by the artificial lights of this world. We do not see the true value of our own spiritual treasures when we are blinded by the glitter of gold. We do not see the true power, mercy, and forgiveness when we are blinded by the sparkle of the sword. We do not see each other as sisters and brothers all in one God's family when we are blinded by the fires of division and hatred. The light of this world judges our dignity, beauty, and value by how attractive we are, how much money we make, the homes we live in, and the cars we drive. The light of this world judges us by whether or not we are born or unborn, too young or too old, in shape or out of shape. To understand our true identity created in the image and likeness of God, created in the image of Jesus created by the workings of the Holy Spirit, we must judge ourselves by a different standard than this world uses. It is not enough to pat ourselves on the back and say, I'm a good and gifted and beautiful child of God. Yes, that's true, but if we don't recognize that same truth in everyone we meet, then we are using a double standard. Jesus looked through the eyes of faith and called his first apostles. One of the reasons, as I said on our introductory night on Sunday, one of the reasons some of the religious leaders did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah was because of those he chose as his inner circle. Let's just say the apostles were not on any first century list of the top 12 most powerful and famous people. The world was inspired by the example of St. Teresa of Calcutta but what can be missed is that Mother Teresa did not go to the outcast to be Jesus. She went to the rejected and the suffering to find him. The eyes of this world continue to be superficially critical and often misjudge someone's God-given dignity and potential. Ludwig von Beethoven was described by his music teacher as hopeless as a composer. <laughs> we still sing one of his songs from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and I didn't write it down because I thought I would remember it, and now I forgot it. What is it? Oh, who's from the choir? No, oh, we can't say that during Lent. <laughs> joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Don't start singing. <laughs> Albert Einstein did not speak until he was four years old and could not read until the age of nine. He was described by a teacher as mentally slow. 
and adrift with foolish dreams. The author of the book MASH, which would later become a movie and a mega hit television show was rejected by 21 publishers. Steven Spielberg may have won three Academy Awards and is considered one of the most successful filmmakers in Hollywood, but in junior high school, he was placed in a learning disabled class, lasted a month, and then dropped out of school forever. He never graduated from high school. Thomas Edison's teachers put a note on his back saying this child is too stupid to learn anything. He failed over 10,000 times before a light bulb finally went on. <laughs> Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor who complained he was lacking in creative ideas. Elvis Presley was fired from the Grand Ole Opry and told to go back to truck driving. Henry Ford's first two automobile companies failed. Abraham Lincoln failed in two businesses, suffered from a debilitating depression, was rejected from law school, lost four jobs, was demoted in the U.S. Army from captain to private. He lost five elections before he was elected as President of the United States. Michael Jordan, perhaps the greatest basketball player in the NBA, was cut from his high school basketball team. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, was a Harvard University dropout and started his software company with an investment of 50 bucks. Oh, to have been a neighbor who gave him another 20. <laughs> J.K. Rawlings, author of the Harry Potter series, was rejected by 12 publishers. Stephen King, rejected by 30 publishers. Vince Lombardi, the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers and after whom, after all, the Super Bowl trophy is named, was in his early coaching years described as having a minimal knowledge of football and lacking in motivation to lead a professional team. One young woman was fired from a local TV station and told that she was unfit for television. That young woman was Oprah Winfrey. One young man was so petrified of public speaking that he became sick to his stomach before every speech. He finally dropped out of his high school speech class, but when in college, he was forced to take a public speaking class. When the professor saw his pale white face erupting with nervous tics, trembling hands, and shaking knees, the professor went up to the student and advised him never to go into a profession that required public speaking, and that young man was me, and what am I doing here? <laughs> of course, there are millions of people like all of us who probably won't make it to the history books, yet who will surprise and have surprise family and friends by excelling at something we never thought we could ever do. Helen Keller overcame being both blind and deaf. President Franklin Roosevelt had polio and sat in a wheelchair as he guarded, guided the nation through the Great Depression and World War II. At the age of 62, Colonel Sanders hit the road and lived in his car. Over 1,000 restaurants rejected him. And now you can find a KFC in Prague in the Czech Republic. It is very human for us to judge one another and attach labels based on mistakes, shortcomings, and physical challenges. It is common that we form our entire image of someone based on a first impression. Respect means to take a second look with the eyes of the soul. But it is very human for us to label people by their physical features, by their mistakes, to have an image of ourselves that is far less than how God created us and how God has called us and how God has gifted us. What do we think of someone over 70 years old? What do we think of our own capabilities when we get past the age of retirement? There is no retirement from the church. Sorry. Golda Meir was prime minister of Israel at 71. 
George Bernard Shaw was 94 when one of his plays was first produced. Benjamin Franklin was 81 when he worked on the US Constitution. Thomas Edison was still making pioneering discoveries at the age of 83. Michelangelo designed the dome of the Basilica of St. Peter in Vatican City when he was the young age of 80. Queen Elizabeth of the United Kingdom is in her 90s. Pope Francis is in his 80s. But the most dramatic example of how blind the world can be is the story of my most favorite and perhaps the most famous of all rejected losers, Jesus Christ. The greatest limitation we face in our lives is not our weaknesses. Rather, the greatest limitation we face in our lives is the limited judgments we make about others and about ourselves. It is a limited judgment when we cannot see that every human being without exception is gifted by the Holy Spirit with talents and abilities and special graces. We can all surprise ourselves with exceptional occasions of greatness. We have the capacity to grow, develop, learn, change, and become surprisingly more wonderful than ever we expected others or ourselves to be until we draw our last breath, all because of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. None of us are too young or too old to rise above the limitations of age. None of us are too sick or too frail to make our contribution to the church. None of us have used all the gifts God has given to us. None of us knows ourselves so completely that there's nothing new to learn. Through our faith, we even learn from suffering and pain. Like St. John Paul II, we can teach our greatest lessons and how we cope with disease and how we die. The real power of sin is that we see others and ourselves as somehow less than God created us because of our all too human weaknesses and mistakes. It is the power of sin when we allow our imperfect humanity to blind others and ourselves to our true dignity and worth, our true potential, our gifts that each and every one of us here without exception still have for the good of the body of Christ. Indeed, part of our true identity is to see every weakness, limitation, and mistake as an opportunity for growth and learning and the deepening our faith by the grace of God. We are ever challenged to see past the superficial judgments we make in order that we may look in the mirror and we may look in the world and see every child of God without exception as created in the image and likeness of God. And it is by grace that we accept this challenge. Sure, we can feel guilty for our mistakes, brought low by our sins, humbled by our all-too-human weakness. Yet our Lord Jesus Christ comes to us in the Eucharist to strengthen us and rebuild us through forgiveness and mercy and compassionate understanding. Forgiveness is not forgetting. We do have memory and the memory can still have the power to still wound. Forgiveness is when the love is bigger than the sin, when our love for ourselves and for others is bigger than our own sins and bigger than their sins. And if we cannot love others because there's no love coming back, then we love ourselves so that their sin doesn't have that power over us. Through this transforming power, the perfect love of Jesus Christ shines through our humanity and gives us the courage to open our eyes to the challenges other people face in their lives. We become the witnesses to the power of Jesus Christ that has come through us, through our own weaknesses. And by this witness, we encourage others to be strong in the faith. We become prophets of encouragement people of faith who are able to see beyond the mistakes, limitations, and weaknesses of others and point to the greater good that is in all God's people. Each time we come here for Mass, 
we celebrate that real person and presence of Jesus Christ, not only in the Eucharist, but in the hearts of each and every person gathered here. We are walking Bibles. Why, we are tabernacles of Christ's presence. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit, and by grace we become and go forth into our world as the very body of Christ. By grace, our eyes are open to the more that is in everyone because we've discovered the more in ourselves. Otherwise, in our blindness, we can become like the people in the hometown of Jesus. They only saw a carpenter's son born of a peasant woman and missed the Son of God. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit is through lives of ordinary people doing extraordinary things as a community. The Holy Spirit moves through the sacramental life of the church, and it is in these sacraments that we experience most profoundly how the Holy Spirit works. I have witnessed over and over again how in the reception of the sacraments, people change, lives change, and yes, one person at a time, the world changes. Throughout the documents of the church, the baptized are to be co-responsible for the mission of the church, always in communion with the local, that is the archdiocese, and the universal church, that is the church throughout the world. In the Second Vatican Council, in the decree on the apostolate of the laity, we see that we have a very serious responsibility, the two of us, clergy and lay people, to call forth the baptized, to take their rightful roles in helping to carry out the mission of Christ. The document reads, for the Christian vocation by its very nature is a vocation to the apostolate. No part of the structure of a living body is merely passive, but has a share in the function as well as in the life of the body. So too in the body of Christ, which is the church, the whole body, in keeping with the proper activity of each part, derives its increase from its own internal development. In other words, be the church you want the church to be. The document goes on to say, indeed the organic union in this body and the structure of the members are so compact that the member who fails to make his proper contribution to the development of the church must be said to be useful neither to the church nor to himself. Ouch! The Code of Canon Law put it a more kind way, stating that membership of the church means that every single one of you, everyone who belongs to a parish, has a right to participate in the mission of Jesus Christ. Every parish, the archdiocese, and the universal church is given by the Holy Spirit every gift we need to meet every need we have. In our parishes and in our church, it is not an option to be a spectator. A marvelous challenge to every parish is the question, if every single member of the Church of St. Stephen in Anoka came forward to offer their gifts, could we handle it? What a challenge to us as a parish to lead by example so that we create a place where every single person can come forward with their God-given Holy Spirit moved gifts and we have a place for it. We are in an age when we sit in front of screens even in the life of faith, we have Zoom and live stream. The internet may be a window into the world, but the eyes are still the window into the soul. As the pandemic passes, we need FaceTime. Thank you for being here. We need community time. We need to be in the presence of one another, to be formed and reformed by the Holy Spirit so that we love and support one another through challenging times. 
the Holy Spirit who elevates us above and beyond all that divides us to truly transform us into the body of Christ, the church that is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Once upon a time, not too long ago, but really far, far away in any similarities to anyone here is purely coincidental. There was a beloved pastor who was one year from retirement. One day the bishop called and asked him to take an old abandoned church in a farm community that was near a large metropolitan area and ready for rapid development and expansion. The pastor in obedience to his bishop reluctantly accepted the assignment. One afternoon he traveled to his new parish and was devastated by what he saw. The church building was in worse shape than he had ever imagined. He tried to pull open one of the double doors. The rusted hinges resisted, but then he gave it a hard tug and the door opened and proceeded to tear off the hinges and come crashing down, almost killing him. He gulped, inside was a total mess. Pigeons flew wildly. Unidentified creatures scurried to escape. And there, there between the rows of rotted pews grew large corn stalks, now dried and lifeless. You see, birds and animals had brought in the cordon seed and a leaky roof had germinated the seeds. He grabbed one of the corn stalks and tried to pull it out. <laughs> For those of you who have ever tried to yank a corn stalk out of the ground, you know what happened next. The brittle leaves cut his hands, the stalk broke in half, and the good father went tumbling backwards into a pew which promptly collapsed. To add misery to this insult, the collapsing pew broke through the floor and plunged father into a sub-basement where he looked up at the startled and wildly flying pigeons who must have thought he needed more color on his black clothing. <laughs> he did what most priests do when it was all too much. He cried, said a prayer, fell asleep. When he awoke, the setting sun was streaming in through the pieces of the stained glass windows that were still intact, yet shone even more brightly where the glass was broken. In the play of color and shadow, the corn stalks looked like a standing crowd of faithful people. It was the vision he needed. With renewed energy and more strength than he remembered having in years, he began to pull apart the old pews and flooring, piled them outside, and set it ablaze. The fire lighted the whole outside of the church, and he kept working. In the farmhouses and suburban cul-de-sacs of the neighboring fields, people were sitting down to supper. The glow out their windows was unmistakable. The old church must be on fire. Though they had long, uh, long since attended another church in another town, this is where many were baptized, married, baptized their children, and buried their parents. Food was left on the tables as the members of the volunteer fire department jumped into their trucks and headed for the church. It wasn't too long before the local volunteer firefighters stood there staring at the silhouette of a limping man as he hauled out more pews and more floorboards. He introduced himself as a new pastor and shared the bishop's vision to rebuild this church and parish. As the, evening <laughs> As the evening wore on, more than 20 people had come by to help out. Over the next several months, garages and farm shops were turned into places where lumber was planed, pews built and varnished, and roofing supplies stored. A lifelong parishioner stopped by and confessed that years ago for safekeeping, she had taken out of the church all the candlesticks, the processional cross, and the Eucharistic vessels. Perhaps the children could help polish them. <coughs> Even the good Lutherans, they would stop by the church, bringing good wishes and, of course, sandwiches, coffees, and donuts because they knew how Catholics are rookies at fellowship. 
On Easter Sunday, all was ready. Father bustled about making sure the servers had their last-minute instructions. He asked them three times if there was a battery in the new wireless microphone. When the bishop arrived to bless and rededicate the church, the place was packed. Oh, and how the bishop went on and on and on and on, as bishops sometimes do. I don't care if I get fired. <laughs> oh, and he spoke about growth and expansion and renewal and how he had picked the right pastor. Finally, he thanked the good pastor and invited the people to join him in a huge and thunderous applause, complemented by a standing ovation. After being invited to say a few words, Father went right past the pulpit and down the aisle, looking at each family and each person that he had come to know in the rebuilding of their church. And to each of them, he gave a measured solo applause. From the back of the church, because he wore another new wireless microphone that had a new battery in it, he finally spoke. You are very generous in thanking me. Now let me thank you. From this day forward, when you look at this beautiful church and you want to give me credit, remember what it looked like when it was just me and God. For your final reflection, first make the sign of the cross, then offer a prayer, a Hail Mary is fine, and then ask yourself, it's a wonderful Lenten reflection when doing a parish mission, are there gifts from the Holy Spirit that you have not yet shared with your community of faith? If not, why not? Secondly, are there people with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that have not been invited to share these gifts? The best invitation is face to face. Remember, God sent that email and none of you got it. Well, I miss you already. This has been a real blessing for me to lead this parish mission and draw us more deeply into the sign of, of the cross as we prepare for the great feast of Easter. Hopefully Pentecost will be something you won't keep secret and you'll share with the world out there even if they do ruin it. Father Bennett and Father James are very lucky to have such a wonderful people and you are greatly blessed to have two wonderful priests. And I am honored and privileged to have spent this time with you and to bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, um, to end a couple of words. Uh, first of all, uh, I think I shared this with many people that um, I've tried for a number of years now to get Father Charlie to come and preach our Lenten retreat, both here and at my previous parish. And so uh, thanks to Meredith, she was the one that made the difference because she was the one who did the ask that finally got uh, Father Charlie here. And, uh, and it's a great sacrifice for him to come here because not only is he the pastor at St. Gerard, our neighboring parish, but he's also the vicar general of this archdiocese. Uh, what the vicar general means is that um, all the troubles in the diocese eventually ends up at his desk. <laughs> and he has a special drawer dedicated to me. And so, uh, as, as we conclude the mission tonight, um, I want to remind you, remember the deal that we made, right? That if you come and did not like the mission, Father James would buy you a beer, right? But if you like the mission, then you are going to buy me a beer, <laughs> right? Because, no, because I want to set it up so it's a win-win situation for all of you. And so I will have many St. Patrick Day celebrations uh, going forward. 
And so, Father Charlie, once again, thank you for your presence. You honor us with your presence. Thank you for your words. And, um, you know, we are grateful and edified by your words. And um, hopefully this will launch us into an even holier Holy Week. And, you know, that we are hopefully face, the pandemic is now behind us, uh, that uh, your words will inspire us to rebuild our church in a completely radically new way. And so after this presentation, we invite you to please linger longer to enjoy some refreshments and fellowship. And so please join me once again in thanking Father Charlie for his presence. <laughs>